Hey everyone, uh, I'm recording this not too uh, long before I actually bike into work, which I'm biking again, which is awesome. Uh, I wanted to just record a couple of minutes of me talking about what I saw at a Nintendo 3DS event yesterday here in San Francisco. Um, I, the reason we ended up going, or I ended up going, was because I was hoping maybe there'd be some interview dump truck opportunities out of it. I've been trying to go to a couple more press events than Giant Bomb normally goes to in the hopes of securing some of those types of interviews. Um, but as it turns out, there were largely just Japanese video games there. Uh, no Japanese producers. Um, but the flip side of that is the games they announced at the Nintendo Direct uh, yesterday morning were, you know... Whatever you think of them, whatever you think of Nintendo's strategy of harping so much on nostalgia and bringing up uh, a lot of these uh, games that we hold very sacred, uh, they're their big deal. Like, whether or not you wanted a, a sequel to a Link to the Past, we're getting one, and that's, and that's a pretty big deal. And I got to go to this event and actually play uh, Link to the Past 2. I mean, I guess I should say they're not calling it Link to the Past 2 yet. All they've said is that it's Link to the Past World... Whatever that means, um, they haven't actually contextualized that uh, in any meaningful way. They're just saying it's another game set in the Link to the Past universe, which for all intents and purposes may as well be Link to the Past 2. Uh, who knows how that will actually be sort of set in the Zelda arc. I guess I might as well start with that one, because that was the big deal coming out of the Nintendo Direct. That remains the big deal uh, coming out of the Nintendo Direct. And I, more than anyone, was I was surprised they were going to let us play it uh, right away. I know they've said it's coming out holiday 2013, which I think it's funny sometimes when Nintendo makes these bold proclamations about a release date because holiday 2013 comes across to me as summer or holiday 2014. Uh, they're just not that great at sticking to release dates like that. But in any case, uh, the event I went to started, it opened up with a series of people giving little speeches. Um, bunch of kind of nameless executives from from Nintendo talk, giving their little spiels, uh, going over some data. There were was some interesting bits, you know, they kind of revealed some data about the eShop. Uh, not hard numbers that are all that uh, revealing or impressive that I'm really not going to go into right now. But the argument they were trying to make was that the eShop is influencing meaningful sales. Uh, the big example they pointed to is that Luigi's Mansion, which has sold something like 400,000 copies, has sold most of those at traditional brick-and-mortar retailers, you know, your Best Buys, your Walmarts, your Targets, whereas Fire Emblem Awakening has sold uh, its 200-something thousand uh, largely on the eShop, uh, and that those people that purchased on the eShop are all, were also very likely to purchase DLC. Um, argument could be made that the lack of retail supply for Fire Emblem and Awakening may have influenced the uh, influx of eShop sales, but nonetheless, I am remain super excited about Nintendo's continued commitment to having digital releases day one for big retail products on their digital storefront. To have a platform holder putting their stake in the ground like that is really impressive, uh, and it should hopefully get the rest of the, the rest of the industry to to get on board. So after they did all that, then they had Bill Trinan who you've seen on stage before at various Nintendo events, at E3. Uh, he did a short demo of Mario and Luigi Dream Team, and then also revealed the games that we'd be able to play in a room uh, adjacent to where this little presentation was occurring, and he said we get to play Link to the Past. So, of course, there was this mad rush for people to run over to Link to the Past, so the first thing I went and did was go and play Mario and Luigi Dream Team uh, and try and play the other games that were at this event, knowing that Link to the Past was going to be swamped with people uh, the entire time, and then I'd get around to that eventually. So I played Mario and Luigi Dream Team first, and I've been a huge fan of the Mario and Luigi games. I've played all of them and beaten all except for the first one, uh, and the only reason I didn't beat the first one was because I made the tragic mistake of turning off my Game Boy Advance in the middle of saving. I thought it was done. It was not done, and they warn you, don't turn it off in the middle of saving, and I did, and I lost my save, and I didn't really feel like playing whatever 20-something hours that I had invested into the game so far. And Mario & Luigi Dream Team, I don't think it'll come as much of a shock, feels like another Mario & Luigi game. And I actually mean that in 
in pretty much a complimentary sense. Uh, it feels very familiar. It feels it, it's very funny because the, the the translation is being done by by uh, Treehouse again, Nintendo's excellent localization studio internally, and especially if Paper Mario, the last one on 3DS, didn't feel like enough like an RPG, it feels like this this one is going to have a little more of that. You know, the the hook this time is that. Luigi can fall asleep on this pillow because you're trying to save this pillow race. I don't know. You know, it's goofy stuff that, like, as I try to explain it, makes it sound really dumb, but the way that they present in the game is is really funny and clever. Uh, so I'm not even going to try to do it. Uh, but just know that there is a motivation for you to be playing and rescuing Princess uh, Peach again. Uh, and when Luigi falls asleep on these pillows, uh, you go into this dream world. And in the dream world, that's where you can save the pillow people. And... The puzzles that are set up in the dream world, uh, a it becomes a, a 2D game. So there's some platforming, but you know don't don't think for a second this is like a traditional Mario platformer or something like Mario 3D Land. Like this is pretty pretty basic. It's meant for uh, just a, a different style, I think, a different perspective. Not necessarily uh, inferring this is a hardcore Mario platformer. But nonetheless, uh, when Luigi is asleep, he's still in that dream world with you, but then Luigi appears on the second screen. And you can cause Luigi to sneeze by sort of like pecking his nose, which will then allow him to interact with things in the environment. So for example, uh, one of the, the early puzzles is uh, you can't quite read this ledge, but then there is this um, sort of like wooden structure in the background that's got some leaves on it. And if you make Luigi sneeze, he then takes control of that object, and you then, using uh, Luigi's mustache on the second screen, you drag his mustache, and Mario can then get connected to that, and he can slingshot uh, across the, the screen. So it's little things like that. Uh, or if he sneezes, it can bring uh, coin boxes from the back to the front, which then, in addition to giving you items and coins, can also provide uh, a pathway to another part of the area. Um, so I played that for about 20-30 minutes. Uh, I wasn't reading a whole lot of the translation, uh, largely because I was trying to get a handle on the mechanics. And again, if you played a Mario and Luigi game, this is going to seem pretty familiar. Uh, but in one of those comfort food sort of ways, like really well written, fancy comfort food. Like when you go to a restaurant and you get mac and like gourmet mac and cheese. Like I feel like that's what the Mario and Luigi games are are kind of like. And and this one seems. Like it's going to please the the people that it has pleased in the past, and that includes myself. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm not sure there's much else to say about it except that there's another one. It seems very good. And I'm looking forward to playing more of it. Um, from there, uh, I went and checked out. Let me check out the full title. Mario. Mario and Donkey Kong Minis on the Move. Uh, the I have not played any of these games. I am familiar with them. I know that they are more puzzle centric, and uh, Minis on the Move is, remains in that vein. Um, the demo they kind of had set up allowed you to play four different modes that had variations on the basic concepts that drive uh, Mario and Donkey Kong Minis on the Move. Uh, the one that I found the most appealing, uh, so it was basically the general setup. Uh, you've got this little, like, kind of like mini Mario who's kind of a wind-up toy and he moves along a track and you're trying to get him to a goal. There are medals along the way. Uh, the gameplay mechanic is you dropping down track pieces. So you've got you know straightaways going up, curved roads. Um, in the main mode that those pieces appear kind of like pieces appear in Tetris. So they kind of like blip down uh, one after another. Uh, you can make the pieces come down faster, but I think you can only have five pieces at once. It might be four. Um, but you also have items that appear. For example, a, a bomb will appear, and if you drag a bomb onto the screen where you've already dragged a tile for Mario to walk through, you can destroy that tile. The way that traditionally comes into play is that in order to get all the medals, uh, you're going to have to get him to loop around the map a little bit. And that may require removing tiles that were previously useful but are no longer useful if you want to get all the medals. Uh, so you don't have to do that. You can have Mario just kind of make his way over uh, to the exit right away. But if you're one of those people, like many of us are, who play games, that is a perfectionist, wants all the 
gold stars and get a perfect on every single stage. Uh, you're going to have to play with these other tricks uh, in order to do so. And I found it, I found it really satisfying. Uh, I actually laughed because uh, the, the guy uh, who was kind of over there demoing, I had seen him at previous Nintendo events before, and he asked me, you know, what do you think? And he was actually, you know, usually that's sort of a BS question when you go to these events, and you just kind of play nice even if you didn't care for the game, um, which maybe isn't the way to do it, but that's just sort of the way it is done. Uh, and I said, well, and this will be my criticism of, of any puzzle game that Nintendo presents to me, it's not the cross 3DS. And I stand by that complaint. I don't know why Nintendo has not made it for cross 3DS. Why do I have to download crappy iPad Pacross games just to get a little bit more? Just like we go right into my veins. Cross 3DS. Damn! I guess that's maybe the Megaton that they're saving for E3. I don't know. So there are, various, uh, there were variations on that mode that they were shown. One uh, involved um, having two Marios. And then you have to manipulate both of them at the same time or manipulate their paths at the same time. A lot of that uh, does not involve uh, laying down pieces, but instead, uh, all over the track are little circles, uh, and you can adjust those pieces and rotate them. Uh, but the challenge comes from getting both those guys to, to loop around, uh, and then there's also a time constraint if you're going for the perfect. So you're trying to get these medals, and you're trying to get the right time, and you're, you've got two Marios going around the map, and it gets pretty complicated pretty fast, uh, but in a really enjoyable way. Uh, the third one they showed was uh, basically you have a set number of pieces. Can you get Mario to the goal, get the medals with the pieces that you have? Uh, as opposed to uh, the first mode I described where you can kind of get rid of pieces and new pieces will show up. Uh, as you wait for those pieces, the time is going down uh, or going up and you are less likely to get a perfect on the stage. So there's the kind of the risk reward there. Uh, whereas in this mode, uh, you... You only have a set number of pieces. That might have been my favorite mode, because I like just having a set number of pieces, uh, knowing that the solution is right in front of me, and that if I only work at it long enough, eventually it'll, it'll start to make sense. And there's a fourth mode that I didn't really play with too much, but basically it's like a huge open environment, and you try and collect uh, as much of these little uh, gold stars as possible, and you can you have a time limit, and you also have timers on the, on the grid, but it's a huge, huge, huge area that you're kind of running around in, uh, that's that's much larger than than anything I saw in the other modes. So yeah, that seemed that seemed fine. Uh, I haven't played those games in the past, uh, but I do like a good puzzle game. And if Nintendo's not going to give me Cross 3DS, then I guess I can settle for Mario and Donkey Kong minis on the move. Uh, the other game I played very briefly because I was waiting to play uh, Link to the Past was Donkey Kong Country's Returns 3DS, which is a, a port of Retro's excellent Wii platformer. I thought. Uh, I agree with some of the complaints that people had with that game of having to execute the roles by shaking the Wii remote uh, was not precise, and in a platformer like that, you want precision, uh, and that led to unnecessary deaths in the in the Wii version. But I, I thought it was a gorgeous looking game, well designed, super fun, uh, and the 3DS version has new levels. Um, th the problem I have with it is that it does not look very good. Uh, the frame rate is all over the place, uh, it looks oddly pixelated. Um, that's with a 3D on and off. It just didn't. It didn't feel right. Maybe I'm not used to the weight of of Donkey Kong and how you play that game. Uh, I will be honest in that I only played for I think like four stages, but I wasn't really feeling it. And I think the frame rate had a lot to do with that. Game's not done. Stuff like frame rate happens uh, towards the very end, and the idea of having that game on the go has a certain appeal. I don't know if it has enough of an appeal to get me to want to play that game a second time. I'd rather have had, had, like anyone else, a wholly original platformer in that style. Um, or they could just go ahead and please announce what the hell Retro is working on. But, in any case, uh, some technical issues, yeah, definitely uh, kind of keep me wary of that port of the game. But there are new levels. Uh, the roll is now attached to a button, which is an improvement. Uh, I just don't know if those improvements are enough to get me to kind of go back to the well. And last but not least, even though I think I said I was going to talk about it at the start, but I apologize because the story I started telling made it more sense to talk about the games in the order I actually played them, it was Link to the Past. So the dungeon they showed in that trailer uh, is basically the dungeon that they let us play. Um, it's funny because you start 
in the dungeon and you're at the entrance and you can walk out the entrance and then you get a little triforce like loading screen in the corner but then it just loads you back to the front of the dungeon i thought i would try though right like i, I didn't think they were letting us out you know the overworld but uh, i had to at least poke at it and see see what they were and weren't going to let us do um the first thing that's striking about it is that the art style doesn't look terrible uh i don't think it looked that great uh, during the nintendo direct i think a large part of that was attributed to the way that the 3ds resolution just does not scale very well because it's a smaller resolution so the art styles that are made for that resolution don't come across very well when blown up for things like an hd video stream and then you add compression and things like that and there are all sorts of really good reasons why it would not look as good uh, as the designers intended uh, i think it looks pretty great uh, I'll agree I'm with the camp of that man wouldn't it have been nice to have like a high res 2D all sprites linked to the past sequel, but you know, it's unrealistic. I'm I am here in reality. That's not gonna happen. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that Link to the Past when looked down at 3DS screen looks gorgeous and the art fits and it's it it looks really nice. Um, it's not as stylistically appealing as a Wind Waker. Um, it's not as immediately like, oh man, as, as a game like that, it has more in common, I'm going to scare some people off with this, with New Super Mario Bros. U than it does with The Wind Waker, but I feel like it's a better in-between and when in motion and the animation and the way it just, I don't know, there's something about it. It looks really nice and, it, and I would encourage people to download the trailer on their 3DS from the eShop. I think it's under the Nintendo Direct section of the eShop. Of the eShop. See what it looks like on the actual screen, because I think you'll be more impressed than you were from that video. In terms of how it plays, it kind of plays like a Zelda game. You can attack, you can hold uh, your sword to, to charge attack, uh, or to, to spin. Um, if you've got full hearts, you kind of shoot off a little projectile. You The items I had access to were a hammer and a bow and arrow. The hammer you were using, uh, if you saw in the video, there were sort of like these smiley face jump pads. So you kind of knock those down, you get on top of them, and it shoots you up to the next level. Sometimes that's used for sort of uh, rudimentary platforming purposes of like, hey, there's a moving section. Time it so that you get on to the next ledge. Uh, oftentimes you were hitting those uh, platforms and then moving up to a completely different level that you could not see. Uh, that had a, worked very well with the 3D effects. Um, you were also using that to flip over these little kind of like turtle-like creatures. So you could flip them over and they're going, ah, and you slash them with your sword. The thing that, the, the sort of main hook, uh, I think, is this sort of blend into the wall sketch mechanic that that they touched upon. Uh, and any time, up against a wall, you can blend into that wall, become this little cute 2D drawing of Link that, in some ways, I started wishing was the entire art style of the game, or that the entire world changed when you did that, but I realized that's probably asking too much. Uh, and it allows you to get around the world in a way that com makes you completely rethink a 3D environment. Because if you stand up on a ledge that is above the ground and you see an open window off to the side that you would have no way to get there, and especially because Link doesn't have a jump button, suddenly you sketch up against the wall, shift, 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 you can get through the wall. Uh, there were other instances of this uh, that were actually tied into some pretty um, difficult platforming, at least for a Zelda game. So you, what you'll end up doing is like you'll be, you have Link will be on a little platform and it's moving, and then there'll be a wall, and then you gotta quickly like run up to that wall, sketch, get around, maybe attach yourself to a new platform that's going up, unsketch, get back onto that platform, find the next moving platform, move on to the next one. Uh, it wasn't that complicated, but it laid this groundwork and portrayed a vision that you can easily see some clever designers doing some really interesting things with. So you're doing a lot of that. You're making way out, your way up this dungeon. And at the end, you there's a, there's a boss. I was actually familiar. It's the uh, Moldorm, uh, which if you've played Link to the Past, it's like, you know, this, this worm that's got like a big circle, smaller circle, smaller circle, smaller circle, weak point at the end. Um, and that guy's pretty mean. Every time he hit me, he takes off a heart. You know, I only got hit once, but... Uh, it seemed pretty brutal. Um, it was kind of fun because he's knocking you off a ledge and the way you fall down looks really great with the 3D. Um, 
seems like a lot of the game, if I had to summarize the design ethos behind this new Link to the Past, it's about perspective. Uh, so for example, one, a lot of, one of the puzzles was this room where there are a bunch of kind of broken tiles, and below them are different chests and the way forward through the dungeon, and so you've got your hammer and your whack, and you're whacking those to kind of fall through, uh, all completely enhanced by the, the subtle but effective use of 3D that Nintendo has gotten very good at. Um, and I wish there was more to say about it. Uh, I think it looks good. I think it looks fun. I think that they, they have successfully conveyed interesting mechanics that will make for fun dungeons. Um, I'm genuinely curious about their desire to return to Link to the Past. Why they would want to do that. Uh, that is dangerous, I guess, I guess is what I would use. You know, I'm not one of those people that subscribes to the theory that a new version of a thing you liked or a sequel to a thing you liked retroactively ruins the things that you liked. So if this new Link to the Past isn't any good or is mediocre or it has things we like but a lot of things we don't like, such as a Skyward Sword or a Twilight Princess, uh, doesn't ruin Link to the Past. But it would be disappointing. And... I'm curious to see what they do. I mean, obviously by saying Link to the Past, they are sort of like putting a flag on the ground saying this is important. We're putting certain weight behind this that we don't necessarily put behind every Zelda game. And so for them to do that, ah, it's treading on sacred ground, right? You know, they could have done just done a new Zelda 3DS game. They didn't have to make a Link to the Past. So in some ways when I sort of criticize Nintendo, or at least point out that Nintendo's strategy is largely harping on uh, classic nostalgia, pulling out some of these old favorites and doing a new spin on them, it's also bold to say you're going to make a sequel to Link to the Past, or whatever this set in the Link to the Past world is. Because I'm not so hung up on what that means to the timeline. That, uh, that doesn't mean anything to me. What I'm curious about is why return to this game? Why return to this specific interpretation of Zelda? What is it about this that drew Nintendo back that isn't just a craven, we know a Link to the Past game would sell better than the Legend of Zelda bullshit of bullshit? You know? So I, I like to give Nintendo the benefit of the doubt. I think they make games with heart. I think make, they make games with passion. Um... I may not be a fan of everything they do these days, but I think they do not do anything cynically, or at least largely not cynically. I like to hope that. You know, if you're gonna if you're a person that loves games, you can't be a cynic about everything, and I'm not a cynic about Nintendo. So returning to Link to the Past, I hope, is not a cynical, craven monetary move. Uh, there are certainly re reasons why that makes sense, but I'm hopeful that they really have an interesting, meaningful way that they want to return to this because it gets me excited, gets the kid in me excited because uh, I want to go back to that world. I want to play Link to the Past again. This is a great excuse to do so. Um, and some people have asked, I'll, I'll close out with this, if I was disappointed that they didn't announce a remake of Majora's Mask. And I'll say no because the reason I want a remake of Majora's Mask is not because I want a remake of Majora's Mask. I'd rather have a sequel, or I'd rather have another Zelda game that took just as many bold risks in terms of upending the conventions of that series while also feeling very familiar. I wanted a remake because I wanted people to be reintroduced to that game. That, that, it's a tough game to go back to. It doesn't explain itself that well. Um, it's a difficult game. It's a stressful game. And it doesn't look very good. You know, you kind of have to look at it with uh, nostalgia glasses on, which is what I do. And a remake would make it more accessible to people that didn't give it a chance the first time around. So I'm actually happier they're making another Link to the Past, whatever that ends up being, because I want fresh, new, original games. I don't want remakes. Um, I can go play those original games, and I'd rather go play those original games. And so I'm happy that Link to the Past has new mechanics, you know, similar world in some capacity, but a lot of new things, and that makes me excited. Um, I'm just now curious to see what they do with the Wii U and if we'll get a similar event uh, in the future. But uh, this happened in the middle of the week. We weren't going to be able to talk about these games uh, till the podcast next week. I'm not even sure if I'll be on the podcast next week because Drew and I are flying out to Iceland next week for um, the EVE Online Fan Fest. We're leaving on Tuesdays. So I just don't, you know, sometimes things get weird. So I want to at least get this out there now. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. 
Um, I enjoyed my time with those games. I'm looking forward to playing the final versions of all of them. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing if Nintendo announced Link to the Past 2 at Nintendo Direct, what the hell do they have store for E3? Uh, I'm looking forward to finding out with all of you. And uh, with that, I should probably uh, go to work.